landscapes and incentives to, in a sense, uh, reduce diversification of landscapes, which has all kinds of other impacts on biodiversity and, and another, another, uh, another environmental dimensions. Is that something you've confronted in, in your work, is the success of market entry for smallholder farmers and how you manage the risk that they, in a sense, lose the diversity of the landscapes in which they're operating? Is that, is that something you can, a dilemma you can help, help, help us with? I have to clarify that Olam, we are a very large farmer. So we grow 21 crops across 26 countries and probably one of the most diversified upstream farmer. We are in broadacre row crop farming. We are in perennial tree crop plantations. We are in dairy farming and we are also in forest concessions. The key question for us would be uh, who are we managing this business for? Is it the temporary transient fleeting exiting shareholder of our business? or is it the continuing shareholder of the business? If you take these two different views, you will develop long-term strategy, make investment choices or capital allocation decisions completely differently. And as a publicly listed company, that is always a challenge. So we always tell our investors, if you are investing in Olam and holding the stock for five months and you expect us to develop strategy and take decisions to maximize your interest, uh, we will not do that. So you have to self-select yourselves. And we tell our investors relations team, frighten the living daylights out of potential investors who are going to be holding our stock for five and six months, if, and just get me 50 investors who will take a long-term view. And it is for their, we are putting ourselves in the shoes of a continuing shareholder. And therefore, for us, it's all about long-term. It's not about next year. It's not about the year after that. When you get into a rubber plantation, it takes 12 years after you plan to get the first yield, uh, to get to full maturity. If you do pistachios, the same thing. And if you do palm or almonds or whatever it is, or coffee or cocoa, it's about seven years. So you, all, all, you have to take the long view here. And the farmer always takes the long view. But he's not properly incentivized to take the long view today. Thanks. That's great to hear. Theo, carbon pricing. Um, what do you think of that? And carbon markets in agriculture for farms. Is it something you want, you want to do, you want to be involved in? Farmers I represent seldom have the money to buy an implement. What to say to pay a carbon tax? They're not going to do it now. They're not there. For us in organized agriculture on the continent, there is no difference between climate smart agriculture, mechanization, commercialization, modernization. And at least the African farmers' leaders realize that we need to leapfrog into a different paradigm, and it needs to happen over a very short space of time. And we think it's possible because it happened in communications technology. Africa has moved from the drum to the smartphone in less than 20 years. Can you imagine if we can replace the hando with climate smart agricultural equipment, the latest technology, where we can go? And for us, it is one action. It's not as if we address a farmer on his farm in a number of silos. Th this you need to do to be climate smart. That you need to do to, to, to modernize and so it's, it's one action. And because we come from a very low base, it can be done in, 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 in the southern hemisphere. I also want to touch on the question about the biological uh, farming. You show me the farmer who is not in love with nature who chose this career be, be, be because he's not in love with nature. And yet, agriculture is not in harmony with nature. Nature does not provide surpluses. So there's always a tension between agriculture and nature. It is how we manage that tension that will matter. Our problem, or the problems I have seen with nature smart agriculture is the way it had been presented to farmers mostly because of NGOs who are active in this field and with the best intentions talk about farming without improved seeds without fertilizer and farmers perceive it as people working very hard to keep them poor that's why I'm calling for a substa that's why I think the 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 question from the lady from Monsanto is very relevant. We need to be able to tell farmers, climate smart agriculture means you need to do exactly this, because this is how it will keep your soils healthy. These are the microorganisms 
you need to have in your soils, and that kind of chemical is going to kill them. If we do not make the change on that level, no matter what we agree to at COP21 or any of the other COPs, it's not going to make a difference. And how to get these policies from the clouds and plant them in the ground where the smallholders are, that, that, that's our big challenge. The answer to that is assist us in the farmers' organizations to have the capacity to reach out to our members on grassroots level. And let it make economic sense to them, because farming is a business. If it's not profitable, it's not going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Anna, um, I don't know if you wanted to come in. I, I saw you looking to come in on one of those points. But could you also perhaps say something about the question on, uh, in a sense, linking the forestry and agriculture uh, debates and, and, and the co-benefits there and, and, uh, uh, and how we can do more to achieve co-benefits between agriculture and forestry? So it's really all that we are talking about is how to achieve these global goals while increasing the, the, the value proposition for farmers. So we're talking about increasing productivity, protecting forests, um, uh, in increasing their uh, climate resilience, ability to adapt, and, and how, do we, how do we share knowledge and ensure that they have the tools that they need including economic incentives. So it's really a, a, a package that it's not a one-way solution. And, and how do we use the existing technology that, that adds so much to what we can do right now to actually share this knowledge? And, and we are working with 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 a number of, uh, of of different groups and entities with the financial sector, or uh, with with uh, others to provide this type of uh, of uh, package to producers. And really, it's about coming up with ways in which they can like. We have examples in, in Cote d'Ivoire with cocoa, where farmers were able to increase productivity by 70% without increasing cost or use of um, agrochemicals. And, and with that, being able to actually triple their um, income by hectare, uh, and this is uh, versus the, the, the non-certified farms. So this type of tools are really important. And then learning from, from that and, and bringing into other places. In terms of, uh, and the, the value that forests, we're seeing in, in India what deforestation is doing in terms of uh, uh, bringing serious problems into tea farms that are caused by deforestation. So uh, reforestation being really important and protect protecting from further deforestation being critical for the health of these tea farms. But also, if we're not talking only about farming, but also about um, forestry, we have examples in the Petén in Guatemala where um, is starting with best management practices, but then uh, moving into certification, moving into bringing the market in and, and the incentives brought in by the market, leading to uh, tremendous um, uh, 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 avoidance of, of uh, deforestation, where uh, you saw 20 times greater deforestation in a protected area where no activity should take place versus the multi-zone, the multi-use zone. Um, the community, the, the forest communities were able to develop and design a, a carbon project. And now uh, we'll be able to, uh, it's, it's now, um, uh, this, this is available for sale, this carbon credits, and they will be able to reinvest in their uh, efforts. So again, another example where sustainable development is working brilliantly, so possible. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's very inspiring to see this work. And in a way, 
what standardization or certification can do to, in a sense, make up for the lack of other regulations. And right? it's not alone. Certification in itself, it's just registering what's happening there. But it's really, um, it's, it's really uh, uh, creating a leverage and another incentive uh, from the market for producers to adopt best management practices. But the, the training, of course, is critical. Yeah, got you. Sunny, please. Uh, I just want to clarify because I probably would have been misunderstood. When I said climate smart agriculture and that we support climate smart agriculture, it does not mean that it is low tech or it's low knowledge intensive. In fact, climate smart agriculture is extremely knowledge intensive. Uh, starting from good seeds or uh, integrated pest management or uh, drip irrigation or fertigation or whatever you do to improve efficiency. So it's very knowledge intensive. But it can be also uh, low till uh, to preserve the ecological balance of the topsoil, which is uh, productive. And in terms of carbon tax, you have to be paid by the market for this or it won't work. So we are the world's probably largest supplier of organically certified agricultural raw materials, whether it's organically certified cocoa or coffee or cashews or sesame or even cotton. Uh, and we get significant premiums for supplying that. Organic cashew today, we get a premium of 80% between supplying inorganic and organic. And the only way we can sustain that is to pass a significant part or share the gains with our suppliers, our farmers. We have four million farmers around the world who supply these crops to us. And everybody who's in a program with us, and we work quite closely with people like Rainforest Alliance, uh, Rainforest Alliance we are probably going to now ship the first uh, verifiable climate smart cocoa from Ghana, uh, where you can see in the western part of Ghana, which grows 50% of its cocoa, a significant part of that has come through deforestation. But with Rainforest Alliance, we have now developed a program with about 2,000 farmers covering 6,000 hectares in the western part of Ghana, and we will get a significant premium for our customers for that. And the same thing for customized grades, qualities, and various other certifications, traceability guarantees. Our customers are very anxious whether we're sourcing these raw materials from plantations where there's forced labor or child labor. Now, if you're going to be buying secondhand at the port city, 1,500, 2,000 kilometers away from the farm gate point, you have absolutely no clue where you're buying it from. If you're buying it at the farm gate, that is very different. So if to produce one kg of poultry meat, if you're going to consume two kgs of feed grains and a kg of pork meat, you're going to consume four kgs of feed grains and a kg of beef meat, you're going to consume eight kgs of feed grains. And to produce a kg of uh, poultry meat, you need 6,000 liters of water and a kg of pork meat, you need 10,000 liters. And for a kg of beef, you need 16,000 liters of water. Shouldn't this be priced in? How can we not price this in? And if you're not going to price this in, we are not going to change behavior. Thank you, Sonny. Can I ask Martin, um, you know, we've just heard many inspiring examples of how companies themselves or third sector partners such as Rainforest Alliance can create change. When you read through the INDCs, did you see much mention of that, that in a way the private sector has the power to be transformed and transform itself because I understand from talking to colleagues, this was not so much a feature of the INDCs and the text that's been provided. What do you think is going on there? Why is this not up front and center in these INDCs? It was a bit of a silly example. I started to use the internet in the 90s, and when you were loading a picture, you had a very, very pixely picture first, and then it became more refined, more refined, until you had a high resolution picture. The INDCs are very, very pixely picture. And some of them were put together at the last second, and they all mention agriculture. So that's great, but that's only a start. And I think, you know, and I want to tie in also some of the questions I heard. They have the potential to be transformative. Yes, absolutely. Because they have the political energy, they have the attentions of the, of the prime ministers <coughs> and uh, the president's offices where it absolutely belongs. The transformational potential and that is very much also what I heard here, is if we finally are able to work with the complexities and interdependencies and look at things from very different perspectives. There was the question about agroecology and protection of forests. It's really very easy. The biggest driver of deforestation is still agriculture, and we have to feed more people. We want to lift 800 million people out of hunger and, and, and misery, SDG 2, 
and we cannot afford to further deforest. So we have to restore our soils. We have to put the carbon back in the soils. We have in Africa the youngest continent. We have 11 million people entering the labor market every single year. How do you employ them? The biggest employer worldwide is still agriculture. And yes, there are knowledge intensive solutions, but they are also very low tech solutions. Sometimes to fight soil erosion, you need to do as simple things as building stone walls just to hold the soil back. But that needs education of farmers, that needs extension services, that needs basically communicating the information to the farmers. We have tools for that, which we not quite um, have started to harness in a way that we could. You mentioned leapfrogging, and I like the example from, from drums to smartphones. Well, Africa has the most modern infrastructure for smartphones, quite simply because they were the latest addition to the market. You got sometimes better 4G coverage than in New York City. We have to use that to get the data to the farmers. We have the possibility that every cell phone basically knows its location. So you can provide pertinent and relevant information directly to the farmers. But to tie that together, that is the job of the INDCs. And we have to present to the countries that are now sort of jumping in the cold water with the INDCs saying, we are on board, that there is support and that's also the financing mechanism which is bold enough to take a risk. And I think, again, the Green Climate Fund, that is what... Um, what it should be doing, talking about the private sector. There is a readiness to investment. What is an investment and what is an investor doing? He's judging the risks of this or that investment. So if there's a perceived 7, 10% higher risk in doing the right thing, then this is exactly the sector where public money should be coming in to leverage private funding. And if we are able to do that, yes, I think the INDCs can be transformational. Just, just to uh, push a little more on this, Martin. I mean, why are the INDCs not talking about the distortions in price signals that is really affecting the behavior of all farmers? Is it because that tra often transcends the nation state and it's seen as, or is it that many of the officials simply aren't thinking that, that way yet? And what's going on here? Is it a lack of understanding or this is the wrong tool to talk about that? And when you monitor the INDCs, there were very few coming in until basically June, July this year, and then there was a whole avalanche. I, I've worked with governments for many years. I know how these things are happening. It's a coordination of different ministries that is very difficult, and then you get stuck, and at the last second, basically, the prime minister offers calls and says, oh my gosh, we have to do that right now, and then you fire something out of the window. I think... Quite realistically, this is something we have seen now with many INDCs. The question with pricing is, of course, complicated because then you come into a space of international trade and exactly this fears of interventions that might affect your trade and commerce was what was holding agriculture back for such a long time. But yes, if we in Substar, in you know, the technical committees, can slowly agree on common methodology, on common standards, which is exactly, you know, sort of the FAO space, international norm setting, then we can move into this space while at the same time encouraging um, private investment to do the right thing. And I wanted to pick up on one thing that you said, basically, um, to connect smallhold farmers with international markets, whether that would be a risk to have more monocropping. Well, maybe not, because people are now more prepared to pay for speciality varieties, um, specified coffees, nuts, and so on. If you leave this conference room, you go to the Starbucks downstairs, there's a handful of cash news that you buy for two euros. That's a substantial price. So that could also be going back all the way to the farmers and encourage them exactly and precisely not to monocrop, but to have different varieties that can be connected to the market, because the market obviously is prepared to pay these prices. Thank you, Martin. Hannah, did you want to come in on that? I saw yes, you. Yes, just on the, uh, both on the uh, using technology, so using smartphones, we have a really good model that we are really hoping that we can take globally to the over a million farmers that we are working. And that is in, uh, in Guatemala, working with 12 farm communities or farm groups to start through use of smartphones, not only communicating lesson learned from other parts of the world uh, between farmers, 
but then to get information from them on what kind of support they need into us. But then ultimately our, our vision is to connect the farmers with, uh, with companies and with consumers. And obviously, whether we are looking at price and the cost of things rather than the price, taking into consideration the right the, the environmental and social costs for some of these products, it's really important to bring in the consumer because I think more and more consumers, especially the younger generation, are very interested in that emotional connection with uh, the product that they are buying and understanding because I think that there is an assumption that everything is grown in an environmentally and socially responsible way. And right now, I think consumers are waking up to the reality that, it, that it's not. I think that there are wonderful things happening right now. The question is, how fast are they happening? And we have uh, uh, in numerous examples of good practices in every continent, but how do we make it so that not only we are creating incentives for sustainable production, but that we are just closing the door for unsustainable production? And that, that, that is uh, really uh, uh, important as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Anna. Um, I need to let you guys go for coffee. We've run well over, but that was deliberate, uh, and I didn't see anyone leave. So thanks for staying. I don't think we did just we didn't get the time to get into your question, Danesh, because I think we'd, we would have needed another hour to talk about how on earth are we going to mobilize ourselves to tackle these vast challenges set out in INDCs, which involves you know working across so many non-traditional partnerships, getting the the banking community engaged, uh, even more than it already is, getting the certification community engaged, getting the agriculture ministries talking to the finance ministries and talking to all the other ministries. There's a vast amount of, of non-traditional discussion that's going to be needed here. And then getting the finance, uh, the traditional development finance uh, world even more mobilized in this space. And that's, of course, where the Global Environment Facility as one of the, uh, the larger funders of, of, of work in this area um, can certainly play a role. But I won't dwell on that. Uh, let's break for coffee and, and thank our panel. It's been brilliant. Cheers. <laughs> and, and see you back at 11.30. Please come back. We've got a great rest of the morning too. Cheers.